to um, edit the journals, so they decide what gets published and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. And the stuff that doesn't fit their paradigm, they don't publish. The stuff that fits their paradigm, they publish. Mm -hmm. right. And he came up with this idea of incommensurability, right? Which is that you can't, you can't judge these two paradigms of atoms versus elements, mm -hmm. right? Or the four elements versus the periodic table. They can't talk very well. Because yeah, they're, using, they're different right, language. in a sense, they're incommensurable. Right. They cannot be measured against one another. Right. Now, brilliant idea. He also said that science progresses. We get con we continually get better paradigms because what causes a paradigm to shift ultimately? It fails. Better. Yeah. There's just there's too many failures of this, so we create a new paradigm to under that integrate the failures, integrate the best parts, both and transcend and include. Uh huh. Right. But Wilbur points out in, uh, he calls it the narcissistic move or boomeritis, that Kuhn is one of the most cited, this book is one of the most cited books in the New Age movement. Hmm. Why? Because since paradigms are incommensurate, it's not that one is better, it's simply which one you choose. Right? Therefore, if I disagree with you, yeah, and I don't actually. You come in and you say, "Well, what? What has you choose one over the other?" Exactly, because there's something that you value. There's something that you value. You're making a choice between person A's version and of reality. And by what criteria do you choose your values? If you go all the way down, there's a reality. Correct. Okay, now, okay, here's the, the question the, the, I if you. If you reconnect all of your floating abstractions. Yes, you get down to existence exists. Yes. Okay. Now, is there a difference for you between being and existing? See, this, so, so, so here's the trick. Here's uh -huh. the trick. Uh huh. Define being. That's the thing. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. Is is that it in order to understand anything i must have a pre-understanding of any everything right that something is right in order to in order to go and further that is mm -hmm. i must already have a pre-understanding of what is already in order to be able to understand anything in particular mm -hmm. right what is that pre-understanding is that existence? No. So, so, so he, here's the thing. One way of thinking about it is, okay, I have to understand isness in order to attribute isness to the phone. Right. Right? Well, it presupposes it, doesn't oh, it? Well, it presupposes it. Right. But that doesn't mean I have to understand it. That's, okay, here, here's, the, here's the thing about it, is that I am not, see, what's interesting to me, mm -hmm. Maybe it's because I am looking at Heidegger through my own lens and seeing things that he's actually not saying, mm -hmm. or actually I'm seeing things that he is saying, right, that other people aren't seeing, <laughs> right? Yeah. But I go, I go, like, I, in, in my view, like Heidegger would say, I would, like, that's what I was going to say, no, not I think, therefore I am, I am, therefore I think. Mm -hmm. That there's a there's being, that the problem is is that it pre he, he what he says is that there's a preontic logical understanding, mm -hmm. right, that presupposes anything ontic or existent, mm -hmm. right, and his task was let's understand that. Mm -hmm. Right? Let's understand that, right? Mm -hmm. What happens when we try to understand that mm -hmm. and reawaken that question, mm -hmm. right? Because if we're going to reawaken that question, it seems like a very wholesome thing to do because it seems to be the ground on, on upon everything, which just makes sense to me. Yeah, absolutely. To, to me, okay, to me, that's... Ran in different language in different languages saying the same thing, and language is the house of being, and the differences in those languages lead to different kinds of interpretations, right? Rand, 
uh -huh. says existence is primary. Yes. Okay. We could say that Heidegger says that being is primary. Mm -hmm. But Heidegger says a lot of stuff. Heidegger is so ripe for misinterpretation. Yes. Because everything he says, he questions. Yes. And in the end, he comes up with a stance uh -huh. of stance. Right. And that stance is not grounded in anything except stance. Yeah, the clearing. Right? And that is where he disconnects from being. Because what he says is anything you can say about being, and this we could get back yes. to the non-dual thing, anything you can say about reality, anything, any way that you can define yourself as an idea and therefore it's not you. Right. <laughs> right? Because yeah. if I say I am that, who's looking? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's not me. So you could say Heidegger took that insight and said, therefore, anything that I can say about being, you know, any, anything you can say about the Tao is not the true Tao. The Tao, the Tao that can be spoken is not the true Tao, right. right? You can't talk about being. Right. Because any talking about it clouds yeah, being. Yeah, yeah. Like, I would say that, like, Heidegger's thing was, like, can I find a way to talk about context without making it a content? Right. And my suggestion is that fundamentally he succeeded in creating a conversation. Uh -huh. He failed at concluding the conversation, which was he didn't want to conclude the conversation because that he would be that would be a totality yes. right that. But we have to have a conclusion. We have to act. There's a point where we have to say thinking, His thinking, thinking. His non-conclusion is a conclusion. His non-conclusion is an opening for anything. Yes. And that's the problem. Yes. That's what Rand said. Rand said, look, this is the problem. If you continually question, you cannot live that way. You cannot... Hang on, hang on, hang on. So I get that. Okay. I get that on a larger scale. Mm -hmm. Okay. But when you go... This is what I've noticed with myself. I've noticed that when you're working with me, we go, something I'm fucked up about. <sighs> Clear it away. Opening. Look at that now. I'm now in this opening, right? I'm in a new nothing, let's say, right? That has me see that and make more distinctions. Mm -hmm. But that clearing is presupposed that that clearing is ultimately this is this is what I'm wondering. So, so, so let so me so, so okay, hang, wait, hang, hang, hang on because I've got an answer for that. Okay. This is um, so Buddhist. Nature of phenomena. Is emptiness. Fullness. How does that fit in? Okay. So first let me answer the question that you started to speak. Okay. okay. And and I and I want to kind of recreate what you're saying and then uh -huh. bring a distinction to it okay, cool. to clarify between two possible interpretations of it. Okay, so one way of thinking about brilliant transformational NLP style therapy, uh -huh. like the kind of stuff I like to do, right, uh -huh. is that someone comes in and their way that they're interprojecting their life uh -huh. leads them to a place where they feel stuck or unhappy or non-powerful or something, right? Like their life is happening and the way they're relating to it mm -hmm. has them go, mm. right? So we use transformation, we use circling, we use NLP, we use therapy, we use coaching in order to have them recognize oh, that's how I'm seeing it. Who is it that's seeing that? 